Hey, good evening. Hope you've had a good weekend. We're going to give people a little bit of time to show up before we get started. Got a lot going on this week and the upcoming week, so we've got a lot to talk about tonight. Hope everybody's doing good. Got some people that I know that will be coming in here as we go along, so. <clears throat> if you like, grab yourself a beverage. Tonight we're just drinking half and half. I got tea and, and uh, lemonade together from McAllister's Deli, and it's actually pretty good. So, And it's starting to get hot around here, so it's getting time for a lot of cool drinks. Tonight, we're going to be talking about, we've been doing the... Uh, Oak Leaf Sessions for three incarnations. This is our third incarnation. We've done a couple so far. And for a lot of people uh, that are on the Druid Path, uh, they're new. They are new to it, and they don't necessarily uh, understand a lot of the history of the Druid movement in the United States and around the world. So that's kind of what we're going to talk about tonight. The authors, leaders, and people that have helped to get the movement to where it is today. Some of the ups and downs of things that we'll talk about with that and stuff. And um, uh, this past week on Thursday, we had our uh, class on Sacred Ireland and uh, Celtic uh, cosmology. That was awesome. I had fun talking, doing that uh, uh, class. And... Um, the next class that we're going to be doing is going to be coming up this next Thursday, coming up 7 p.m. Central Time. And we're going to be talking about Philodect and the Bardic Arts. We're going to be talking about sacred poetry, song spells, uh, anything that has to deal with the arts of the Bard. Um, and we're going to be deep diving into it uh, for those that are, that is their vocation. Uh, some are tied and, and lean towards the ritual side of things, and others lean towards the healer, herbal, uh, uh, divinatory side. But right in the middle is, I think, one of the more important parts of Druidic tradition because the, the bards are the ones that keep all of our lore and our history. So without them, I believe that, that we all work hand in hand, not just the Druids that lead and, and the... Uh, 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 of eight seers that heal. Um, I believe the bards have uh, a greater uh, responsibility for a lot of things than the other two denominational parts of Druidry itself. So it goes, there's a lot that goes hand in hand between all three sections of Druid tradition. But uh, before we get started, I want to say hello to everybody. We're starting to get a good group, a little bit of people coming in. Good to see you guys. I hope you've had a great week. The weather has been insanely crazy here. I'm getting tired of rain. I'm thinking if we get too much rain, eventually my town's just going to 
uh, you know, lift itself up off of its moorings and we're just going to float away. Um, we need to dry out a little bit. The only thing that's kind of bad is with it drying out, we're starting to get into this uh, hot and muggy situation. And that's not fun because I have a feeling this summer is going to be very, very uh, warm and not so uh, enjoyable, let's put it this way, because of the fact that we've been so wet. I think the mosquitoes and things like that are going to be horrible. So I hope everything's good where you're at. And uh, I want to thank you guys for coming in tonight and just hanging out with me as we talk and, and do our thing, doing the craziness that's going on around with this pandemic. And I hope all of you guys are healthy and that the kids are good, the dogs are doing fine, that whole kind of thing. So before we get started with the main crux of the evening and our discussion, we're going to do like we always do, and we're going to kind of take just a minute and get everything into a decent energy space. And to do that, we're just going to sit back. We're going to close our eyes. We're going to take three deep breaths, and we're going to chant the all in three times. Ah. May the blessings of body, mind, and spirit be yours. All right. So tonight we're going to be talking about the modern Druid movement. A lot of people are new, and they just know what they know from what they, you know, they've gotten books at Barnes & Noble, or they might have gotten a book from a friend. So basically they know what's going on right now. But right now isn't the, 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 the gist of where, the things that we are doing as a pagan movement and a non-pagan movement because there are various forms of druidry that are not pagan that have been going on for many 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 years um to say uh, to put it this way as far as in the united states we'll get to that in just a minute but as far as in the in britain the uk in ireland druidry in some form has been going on ever since it began but the thing is, though, um, uh, after the, the movements of the Protestant Church and the Church of uh, the, uh, Catholicism and stuff making its way into Britain, Wales, Scotland, Ireland, that whole kind of thing, there was periods where things that were, were underground, then there's times when things were above ground, that things were a little bit more... Uh, uh, in the open, and there were times when it seemed like, over a period of time, that there were uh, parts of Druidry that were being assimilated into the church. That's where we get the Celtic Kirk, Celtic Church, also known as the Chaldee, um, but also within the Church of England, in Britain, and various places, um, there were those that were a part of the Church of England uh, such as the Queen, also Winston Churchill, um, that they were members of Druid orders that were not a that were not recognized by the Church of England, such as the Somerset Order and other things. So it was, um, and the thing about that, the only thing that was kind of bad about that was the fact that, as far as uh, the orders that uh, Winston Churchill and the Queen were associated with, they were mostly um, ceremonial, meaning that they the, the Queen never went to any, never really went through any of the uh, uh, meetings, and, and the same thing with uh, Churchill is mostly it was it was ceremonial. It was like 
an, uh, like being given an honorary doctorate at a university that you never went to. It's just something to say that, you know, we recognize you as a part of our group, so there you go. But it was during this time that uh, as we got closer into uh, the early 1800s uh, and, and things like that, that that kind of mindset started to change. Start, it started to change that, uh, you know, that they would go back and forth, that there were more orders that were starting to come out. As an example, the Welsh Gorset. Um, which is uh, one of the most wonderful th things as far as for bards. The Welsh Gorthus is one of the most beautiful things that anybody could ever want to associate with. Um, there's a lot of high pageantry. There is a lot of, it's just like, if, uh, and one thing I think is very cool, um, it's hard to find if somebody doesn't put it up online, but every so often you can go on YouTube and you can see uh, examples of either the Gorsuth being held or people being inducted into the Gorsuth itself, like being initiated into a group. Well, there are uh, formal uh, inductions of singers, poets, writers, authors, and all these different kinds of things being inducted into the Gorsuth now. And this has been going on forever, for a long time. Um, so some of that stuff is just beautiful. We don't have anything particularly like that here in the United States, but if we ever did, I think it would be really cool because that would be something that would be um, very beneficial for those that want to see more, uh, more uh, a more broad spectrum Druidic experience. Oh, and as we go through the evening here, um, if you have anything that you would like to add to the discussion, or if you have a question, feel free to throw one up there in the in the comment section, and I will do my best to answer it, or I'll point you in the direction to where you can find an answer. Um, one thing that I want to do is I want to make these evenings where we talk together something that you can participate in. It. I want this to be a back and forth exchange. So. Just putting that out there that if you do have a question about anything that we talk about, please feel free to go ahead and, and uh, put a, uh, a question up on the on the screen. Also, just want to check real quick. Uh, give me a thumbs up if you guys can hear me. If I need to adjust my um, uh, volume, we can do that. Sometimes my computer doesn't want to work the best, so uh, just let me know if you're having any trouble hearing. But uh, so looking at it this way, as far as the modern Druid movement goes, it's been around for a while. Um, it has been most prevalent, of course, in Britain and Wales and Ireland and things like that. But there was a time that uh, things started to change even in that vein was the, the idea that uh, some of the underpinnings of what Druidry was going to become started to happen in England with the formation of the Order of Bards, Obates, and Druids, which is today known as Obot. Um, it started out, and if you ever um, get a chance, this is one of the books that I um, recommended in the Druidic uh, uh, Essentials bookshelf. Is a book by Ross Nichols called the, the uh, Book of Druidry. It's got a gold cover, and Ross Nichols was the original chosen chief of the uh, Order of Bards, Ovates, and Druids, and they were have been around for, good God, at least since the 40s, 1940s, early 50s, and went on through a various period until. Um, Hello, Alexa. Good to have you here. Um, there was a, a period where uh, Obot went for so long that Ross was starting to get older and he wasn't able to do the things that he needed to do to keep the order uh, uh, running, you know, as smoothly as it needed to be. So there was a period in which Ross Nichols trained a young druid by the name of Philip Cargom. And everybody that has um, uh, checked into any Druidic reading has definitely heard of him. 
He has written many books. He's done uh, the uh, Druid Animal Oracle with John and Caitlin Matthews. He's also the author of Druidcraft, which is a mixture of Druidry and Wicca or Druidry and Witchcraft. Um, a very uh, interesting book, by the way. Um, but so at that time, it was uh, when Philip Cargump took over as chosen chief of the uh, Order of Bards, Ovates, and Druids, there was a shift. And what I mean in the shift is the idea that ritual forms and ideas within the Order of Bards, o Order of Bards, Ovates, and Druids moved towards more of a more uh, Obot is not 100% neo-pagan. They are, I would say, 80% neo-pagan with a 20% viability of nature philosophy, which is very cool. And I think the reason why that they are like that now is because of people like Philip Cargom. Um, and I believe, I'm not 100% sure, I'll have to check into this, but I believe, I believe that recently he has stepped down from Obod as chosen chief. And I don't know if they're in between uh, finding out who that they want for their chosen chief, or I think they may already have it. But so he's getting ready to do his Ross Nichols and get somebody else in there to carry the uh, organization on uh, as much as it can. Now, one thing that I will say is, uh, uh, Obad is very much based on a lot of of, of, of documentable, documented philosophy. So what that means is everything that they, what the framework that they work work in druid druidically, is very heavily tied into the Welsh side of things. A lot of the Anglo uh, Norman and Anglo Saxon uh, portions of uh, British life uh, through the centuries and things like that. So there's a lot of uh, dynamics and diversity within Obod. If you notice, as far as teaching orders within the world, Obod is number one. The number two is one of the first groups that came to, that started in the United States, and we'll talk about them in a minute. But um, whenever you hear of somebody starting new Druidic studies, um, and they are looking for something to be taught within the main ones that people start out with is getting taught through uh, Obod. Um, I may in the future start an Obod study for myself um, and maybe become affiliated with them. But the only thing about that for me is cost. Um, the Obod courses start at around $300 each. Um, but the only thing is with that is like you are getting what you pay for. There are books, there are pamphlets, there are all these things that come along with it. So it's like you are being backed up in solid uh, natural philosophy, druidic philosophy that comes from within their range. And they have a bardic grade, they have a druid grade, and they have the ovate seers grade. So you can study all of them and become pretty much well well versed in Obad Druidry. And their presence is not just in England. There are Obad groves here in the United States. There are proto groves here in the United States. Um, and I think that's very cool. Um, the only thing that's kind of messed up is we do have some orders here in the United States that haven't really been able to get a foothold outside of the country. Um, we do have a couple Surprisingly, most of our groves that are in, in organizations that have any kind of a foothold outside of the United States are in South America and other countries that are not necessarily European, um, uh, which is, you know, that's cool, but it's just uh, uh, American style druidry as far as that goes, uh, which is, tends to be more neo-pagan like really stuck in neo-pagan doesn't necessarily go over so well um in the uh uk which that's fine you know everybody has their own thing um before we move to the united states we'll talk about some more 
uh, people and places that are um, uh, uh, big in uh, the Druidic movement as far as how they came out. And the next one that I want to talk about is uh, Lady Olivia Robertson, the founder with her brother of the Fellowship of Isis. And the Fellowship of Isis um, is one of the largest goddess organizations in the world. Um, the last I knew, they had probably close to 40,000 members. Um, and one of the offshoots that they have in uh, Donegal, um, Ireland, is the Druid clan of Dana. And I think that there is one group in the United States that is a offshoot of the Druid clan of Dana. And it was sad, uh, Lady Olivia was uh, very active in um, uh, traveling and working with other organizations uh, several, several times. Matter of fact, there is a documentary that has been made about her. And uh, one of the last times that she was here was for one of the last Pantheacons in California. And they had her on video. And she's just a sweet soul, a uh, beautiful priestess. Just she was a delight and very learned. Um, also, as an example, uh, going back to uh, her earlier days, if you ever get a chance, you want to check out something that gives you a little bit more uh, to know about the Fellowship of Isis and Lady Olivia, you want to watch a, a film called The Occult Experience. And um, there is a section of that film that shows uh, some initiations of some priestesses at their castle in Donegal. And this was in the early to mid-70s in which this was filmed. So uh, you can tell that they have been around for a long time. And they are still, even after the passing of her and her brothers and stuff, the uh, uh, Fellowship of Isis is still very much active in the world in pagan and goddess traditions and the Druid tradition with the Druid clan Dana. Um, and so... They are instrumental in, um, uh, you know, uh, getting things started. Also, within Ireland, there is a group. Um, I don't necessarily know who runs it, but you have the IDO, which is the Irish Druid Order. And then within the uh, uh, UK itself, within Britain again, we have another more... Uh, well-known and a little bit more famous group called the BDO, which is the British Druid Order. And within the British Druid Order, we have two people that are, I think, very um, innovative in their approach to Druidry, and that is Philip Shawcrass and uh, the once chosen chief of the BDO, known as uh, called Bobcat, but she is Emma Restall Orr, a great writer, author, uh, one of her best books to me is uh, uh, Thorson's Book of Druidry or Druidic Principles. Um, just incredible writing, just great. And uh, there is video of her and Philip Shawcrass and some others from the group, uh, the British Druid Order, um, it, from the 80s, I believe, uh, taking a um, television crew through a, it's either a built-in situation or possibly Samhain, but um, they are very, uh, uh, I think, very instrumental in getting a little bit more of a uh, pagan uh, outlook on uh, Druidic ritual and things like that compared to uh, Obad. There's different degrees. Um, there, uh, on the farthest end, you have these philosophical druidic groups, which there are so many that I couldn't even begin to name them all. But these are groups that have no pagan affiliation and that they do see nature as important, but they don't necessarily go to the degree as we do within various things. They still have rituals, but the ritual formats and the way that they operate are a lot different from what a neo-pagan group would do. So you have those, you have the main functions of the Obad in, um, 
England. You also have the BDO and you have the IDO uh, in Ireland. So you have a great big base of all kinds of different, and there's so many smaller groves and, and units. You can't name them all um, over in that part of the world. Okay. Here in the United States, paganism in its rarest forms was brought with uh, immigrants. Uh, once we got um, New York going and the Statue of Liberty up and everything, everybody that came from a distant land brought some kind of pagan tradition, pagan superstition, and these various things with them that was part of their family. Um, if anything, these were the purveyors of the first family traditions. Um, over time, it's, it's the idea that as more people came to the United States, those traditions grew. And um, the, the thing that was kind of sad about that, though, is as more people were bringing these traditions and such here to the country, they had to deal with the idea of keeping themselves separated and out of the radar of the churches. Because, even like today, back then, if a church knew that you were pagan or that you did something that they thought that was of the devil, back then they were a little bit more violent about things. Now it seems like you know, it's like not 100% perfect. It's never going to be 100% perfect between pagans and Christians. But back then, there was a lot more uh, divisive, divisiveness and things like that. So there was a long period of where uh, pagan practitioners of all ilks had to keep themselves underground, had to keep themselves hidden. Because if they didn't, they could put themselves and their families in danger. Uh, danger of losing jobs, physical danger, uh, homes being ransacked, you never know. It's like, even in the last 25, 30 years that I've been involved in paganism, I've seen people's homes ransacked, I've seen people's cars mangled, I've seen pets killed, that whole kind of thing because of ignorant people that think we're Satanists, which we're not. Um, so that's always going to be with us in some form. What I will say, though, is since those earlier years here where I live, what we've tried to do is let the people here in the city that we live in, let them know that we are just the same as they are. We have kids, we have jobs, we pay taxes, we do the same thing they do, we just have differences of how we look at the way the earth is, the seasons, and these other things. And whenever you take the time to come out of the shadows, and not hide, then it alleviates fears. And when you alleviate fears, people tend to leave you a little uh, alone a little bit more. It hasn't been perfect. We still have people that lose their shit and come after us, but the numbers and severity over time has gone down, which I think that's a very good thing. And I don't know how many of you out there have had to deal with the same thing, but, um, you know, it's... That's how you can tell if your pagan community is uh, a vibrant, viable one. It's not just the numbers of people that you have involved in your city, but how happy are the pagans in your town? How happy are the groups to know that they can go pretty much every place that's reasonable and hold festivals and rituals and meetings without being molested by a Baptist church or an Assemblies of God or a Catholic diocese? Or whatever. Um, not to say that uh, every place is immune to it. You go into the deep south, you go into some of the southeast, um, and some of the more Catholic strongholds and things like that. Yes, the pagans are going to get a little bit of um, uh, animosity directed towards them. And so it's like um, that's one of the things that. Um, also, looking at the overall movement um, in the United States, you got to realize that paganism really didn't start to take off in the United States until the 60s, from 1960 onward. And the reason why is because there came a point uh, after rock and roll and all these things started to come in back then, you know, it was moving away from the Leave it to Beaver world to sexual freedom, 
women's rights, uh, 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 the uh, uh, freedom of, of African American citizens to vote, and things like that. So things were changing. Um, things were starting to go away from that conservative mindset to a more liberal minded country that was wanting to be able to be free with um, how they perceive deity and things like that. So as the, 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 the hippie movement and other things started to move around, the political climate started to change. And whenever the political climate starts to change, you have an increase and a renaissance from then until now of people coming to the realization that there's more to life and existence than what they find in the Bible or what they would see in praying the rosary or any of these other things that you get from Protestant and Catholic uh, religious doctrine. So they found out, hey, there's the goddess, there's the gods, there's this, there's magic, there's ritual, there's all these things. It's also at this time in the 60s that uh, Gerald Gardner and Raymond Buckland together with other people started bringing Gardnerian witchcraft into the United States via the East Coast. And once that started to get a, a hold into the country, it started to move its way from the East to the West. And for a little bit, people kind of freaked out. They didn't understand uh, the non-pagans. The, the non-pagans started to freak out. They didn't understand what was happening. The, the peace and tranquility of what they thought was a Christian world was basically being shattered. They were, they were finding out that they didn't have the foothold that they thought they had on the minds and, and stuff of people that actually would take the time to think. And the thing that was good about that was, and this is just my opinion, everybody has, I like to know what your opinion is, is the idea that pagans and the idea that paganism had started to finally come to the United States, um, what that did was it, it, it gave intelligent people uh, something else to consider. We weren't locked into a cage that says you're either going to be uh, Catholic or Jewish or Protestant or whatever. We weren't confined. We could see, we could hear the stories. Um, as an example, a lot of times they, they were things, there, you know, book burnings. There were things that, you know, the, the, the books that they thought were inappropriate. Some of those books were considered pagan because they did this, that, and the other thing. In the 60s and moving forward, late 50s, early 60s and moving forward, teachers were teaching more about the Greek myths. Um, May Day, there would be classes where teachers would hold May Day festivals with the children. They would take them out into uh, the schoolyards and collect flowers and make flower wreaths and stuff like that. And they would talk about the historical significance of the Bacchanalia. And all these other things, and before that, it wouldn't it wouldn't be heard of, because there would be too much of a fear of offending someone on the school board or whatever that was highly Christian or highly Catholic or highly Jewish or whatever, because you didn't you just didn't do those things. You just kept your head down and you did what everybody else in society was doing. But with the '60s and that political foment that that new think of, you know, anything's possible. Before, there was like a chain that was kept on the country that said, you can only go this far, and at the end of that chain, that's it. That's all we're going to give you. But we were breaking these chains, and we, we were moving forward. We went in, in, in places and directions that that chain would never let us go. Um, that's why you that are checking this out tonight, that's why you're here, because somebody got a hold of you, at some point in your life and you said and they said to you or it said to you there's more to the world than just what you know and you might have seen a, a, a TV story or found a book or heard from some of the the leaders and authors that we're going to talk about tonight and you said okay well there's more to life than just what I've been told my whole life as a kid or what I learned as in church and so by doing that you expanded your consciousness 
you realize that not one there's not just one thing rules the roost over us spiritually and religiously we're not tied to being monotheists that there's more to it that's why paganism really started to take hold in the country because people realized we don't have to be tied down to one thing to singleness singularity we don't have to be tied to that so in the 60s a man by the name of Philip Isaac Emmons went to Carleton College and at Carleton College he met a man by the name of Bob Larson and the thing about Carleton College was it was a religious school and one of the things that was a requirement of this religious school was that uh, um, uh, students had to attend chapel okay and they uh, you know, kind of hemmed and hawed and didn't really like the idea of uh, of having to attend chapel services it was just wasn't something that they wanted to do so over discussions between uh, uh, Isaac Bonowitz Bob Larson and other people uh, and, and uh, students at that school they formed something known as the RDNA the Reformed Druids of North America basically it was done on a lark and what that lark was is a means for them to be able to fulfill the religious requirement and not be forced to have to go to uh, the school's basic chapel services and what they did was they started to look at practices from the Indo-European uh, uh, side of things moving into uh, learning about gods and goddesses and such and they started to piece together uh, rituals and so forth that worked for them and as it, uh, Isaac said in an interview we were going out in the woods we were invoking various Celtic gods and goddesses and all of a sudden um, they started to realize that basically that what they were doing was neo-pagan and it it fit it worked for what they were doing at the time and as we speak right now the RDNA is still active and there is a splinter well, actually there's two splinter groups there's the uh, uh, new reformed druids of the uh, new reformed druids of North America then you have the new reformed druids of Gaia which are the two offshoots of the RDNA well after a period of, of time getting out of uh, after his days in the um, uh, school there at Northfield Minnesota um, Isaac came into the idea of uh, learning more about ritual learning more about magic and so over time um, Isaac uh, came to uh, Berkeley University and, and when he went to Berkeley he was the first person uh, in Berkeley's history to design his own degree uh, 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 situation and he graduated from Berkeley with a bachelor's in thaumaturgy and basically a bachelor's in magic and matter of fact after he did that Berkeley doesn't allow that anymore that was one and done he was the only one that they allowed to do that and so uh, he was one of the few people that was given um, that degree a bachelor's in magic and what happened after that was uh, through his training and, and time with the RDNA he started to go a little bit deeper into the Indo and proto Indo European uh, styles of Druidic thought and at a time that just the, the stars aligned rightly for him uh, with himself and others uh, brought about the formation of Andrea Fain, the uh, Druid organization, the largest Druid organization in the United States, otherwise known as ADF. Uh, currently, the uh, uh, Archdruid of ADF is John Drum, but past illustrious um, uh, Archdruids include Ian Corrigan, Skip Ellison, Kirk White, 
and various others. Um, and one of the things that separates um, ADF from other Druid groups and Druid orders is the fact that they work on a Proto-Indo-European Proto model, meaning that they're not extantly Celtic. And what that means is the idea that groves are not tied to having to uh, worship the uh, Irish Celtic gods or, or any of the Celtic gods for that matter. It's the idea of how the uh, 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 various nomadic peoples from the Celts and others that came across the European land bridge, the Proto-Indo-European times, and how that affiliated and, uh, and changed uh, religious practice. So when you go to ADF, you can go to a grove that worships the Norse gods. You can go to a grove that uh, worships the Hellenistic gods, um, Greek, Jewish. There are Jewish Druid orders or Jewish Jewish groups that are affiliated within ADF. Or I don't know if they're still active now, but there have been in the past. So this just means that there is a greater a dichotomy of um, groups that work within the ADF's framework of um, uh, uh, teaching and 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 uh, study that allows them to work this way. And one of the things that we got uh, over time from ADF was the axiom "Why not excellence?" And why not excellence is the idea that. So many people in so many covens and groves and, and uh, ceremonial magic groups and all this stuff, they lay this trip out that, oh, I'm so great. I can do all this magic and I'll do this and I'll do that. Well, the idea behind why not excellence is if you say you can do it, show us. Get up there and do it. Um, but, you know, that's the thing, though. You've got to be able to back up what you say. And what you say you know and what you think you can know with things that are factual and actual and working because if you can't back it up, you're basically blowing smoke out of your ass. You're blowing smoke up their ass to make them think that you're something that you're not magically and ritually and things like that. So one of the things that they, that they are very much into is the idea of uh, excellence in um, how you practice and excellence within their teaching product program, which they have an ADF dedicate program, which has been going on for many, many years. And they have what they call ADF SIGs. And SIGs are special interest groups. And special interest groups within ADF are a invention that allow people with various interests to interact and work within ADF's uh, uh, organizational structure. So if you are a person that's into archery, there could be an archery SIG. If you're into polyamory, there could be a group within ADF that are for people that are into polyamorous relationships. If you are transgender, bi, whatever, there are SIGs for that. And what these do is they allow people to participate in ADF um, and still have room to uh, work with others of a like mind on a more minute scale. Also, what that does is it allows for a greater dichotomy of communication. And what that means is that there is an order level that goes like this. This is ADF and it is on one plane that allows for, you know, uh, communication that way. And then you have all of these cross spots going from here to there to here to there, but they all connect. They're all organic and they're always changing so that everybody is always in the loop and it always allows for it allows for greater expression of ADF tradition. It allows for um, greater communication between ADF groves and ADF members. So um, as far as that goes, ADF is one of the pioneers uh, next to the RDNA. Uh, here in the United States of the um, uh, Druidic movement. Now, before we go on to the next, uh, the order that I was affiliated with that kind of brought me into Druidry itself, we go to another order that has been with over the last 
I don't know exactly when it was formed, but we have the AODA, which is the Ancient Order of Druids in America. Also, if I mentioned, if you are any uh, in, in involved in any of these orders, send me a thumbs up or throw me up a loves across the screen so that I know how many people are affiliated. Is there anyone here that is taking the OBOD course? Is there anyone here affiliated with the British Druid Order? Who are you officially, uh, 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 if you are with an order, who are you with? Put it here in the comments. Um, myself, and we'll talk about uh, my affiliations here in just a little bit, but there are so many people that are across the country and around the world that are so diverse in our connections that you never know who you're going to see and who you're going to meet. So I encourage you to put those up. And... All right, we've got almost 80 people here. That is so very cool. I'm glad you guys are here. I'm going to take a drink. Awesome. So, the difference between AODA and uh, ADF and some of the other groups that are here in the United States is AODA is a uh, philosophical naturist and natural philosophy or that also kind of leans more towards ceremonial magic and the lodge structure of its its groves. AODA is more reminiscent of an offshoot of the OTO or some of the other Western ceremonial traditions, but they are still very much rooted in magic, very much rooted in the magical world, and um, John Michael Greer is an author. He's written many books on druidic philosophy and magic within the AODA. And the AODA has been around for a good long time now. I don't know their exact date of origin, but they are another uh, portion and part of the druidic movement here in the United States. Um, Later on in the existence of the ADF, um, at one time there was uh, some uh, growing pains, let's put it that way, some growing pains that went on within the order. And at a time in the early 80s, there was a split from the group from uh, several people, but mainly um, the, the ones that split were Tony and Sable Taylor. And when Tony and Sable Taylor left the ADF, they left and formed their own group, which is the group that I was affiliated with for several years, and that was the Hinge of Keltria. And the Hinge of Keltria was a split from uh, the uh, uh, ADF uh, form of Druidry in that uh, the Hinge of Keltria saw... Uh, Druidic practice as extantly Celtic, and that they looked at it in a Celtic worldview, uh, specifically the Tuatha Dé Danann, the Irish gods, and, and those kinds of things, and they were uh, instrumental in a lot of um, people finding Druidry because in their early years, they published a newsletter slash newspaper called the Keltria Journal. And there are still magazine houses and places that still have old copies of that. And it was very well done. Um, actual newspaper stock, kind of like Circle Network News used to be before it went to its magazine format. So they had that for many years. You could buy it at Hastings. If you remember any of you remember the Hastings bookstores, you could buy that with Shaman's Drum and Pangaea and uh, connections, and a lot of Wiccan and Pagan magazines. So unfortunately, we have very few uh, Wiccan and Pagan magazines left. The only ones that I think that we really have left right now are like Sage Woman and possibly uh, Circle Network uh, Quarterly, the magazine format. But um, back in those times, uh, uh, Tony and Sable developed and worked through to get the Hinge of Keltria working in the United States with groves, study groups, um, a training program, 
and also uh, their uh, Grove Leaders Handbook, which I have, the Book of Ritual, which I have, and some of these other handbooks and things that helped people to form and work within Keltrian Groves and study groups across the United States. And uh, also, uh, just a little sidestep from that, also one of the authors, uh, one of the more prolific authors now in the Druidic movement is a lady by the name of Ellen Everett Hopman. She was the uh, founder uh, and uh, group priestess, high priestess, uh, Druidic priestess for the Order of Nath Gela, which is the Order of the White Oak. And now she is currently uh, the uh, head of the Tribe of the Oak Druids. Uh, she's been writing many books on tree magic and tree medicine and herbalism and druidry. But one of her most seminal works, the one that just kind of tied it all together and made her uh, a very important cog in the wheel of pagan writers, was a book that she read about 20 years ago called People of the Earth, The New Pagans Speak Out. And within this book, she did interviews with authors from uh, gay and straight, Wiccan, pagan, and druidic uh, groups. And she talked to many people. She talked to Isaac Bonhamus. She talked to Tony and Sable Taylor. She talked to Gavin and Yvonne Frost. She talked to many people. And she gave you a little bit of a snippet and an idea of what each of these groups was about. She talked to... I believe she talked to Philip Shawcrass and Emma Restall Orr and a bunch of other people. And it was like looking into the window to see what everybody was about. What were some of the things that was important to them within their form of pagan uh, uh, practice or ceremonial magic or whatever the thing was that they were into. And she made a very big impact in that. And one of the things also... Uh, I was lucky enough to interview Ellen Everett Hopman uh, on my show that I uh, did here years ago called Pagan Perspectives on Blog Talk Radio. I was also privileged to order uh, to be able to interview Dr. Raymond Buckland before he died, and I was also able to uh, get a little bit of information and background on Proto Indo European uh, Druidry. When I did a interview with author um, and member of ADS, Kasur Sarath. So you got all of these people that are very, very instrumental in the uh, droidic movement that a lot of people don't know. And it's like there are people that are out there now, and we're going to give you some names of that, and then we'll talk a little bit about um, things that are going on now. But there are people that have been coming up over the ranks. Uh, for the last few years that are very important. Hmm, excuse me. Some of the people that I believe that are leaders in the Druidic movement for today are people like Nimue Brown. We have Mara Freeman. We have Cyril Zoduvin. We have uh, Ian Corgan. We have Skip Ellison. Um, we have... Uh, 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 God dang, what is her name? There's a woman from Sweden, I think it's Joanne Vanderhoven. Um, you have Laura O'Brien, you have Morgan Daimler, um, and you just have all of these people. These are the people that are, um, uh, moving forward and moving us into a newer realm of Druidry today. You also have, uh, podcasts that are really important. I think one of the best podcasts that you can listen to to kind of give you a background of some of the things that are very important to Druids as far as lore and things go is the Celtic Myth Pod Show by Ruthie and Gary Col Colcom. They're from the UK um, and what they do is they take Celtic myth and they serial serialize it and they tell stories and it's set to music and very, you know, just theatrical, and it's just wonderful. And I've been listening to their podcasts for years. Also, you have Druidcast, which is a cast that is brought to us monthly or when they can get it out from <clears throat> Obod. There's also an ADF podcast 
that doesn't come out as much as it used to, I think, because there's been some uh, shakeups within ADF over the last few years that there are some of the things that they wanted to do, haven't they haven't been able to. So that's been put on the back burner. But we have all these people and organizations. A sad thing that's kind of gone on over the last few years is, uh, like I said, I was a part of uh, Henja Keltria. And for three years, I ran a Keltrian study group. And at the end of that time, I realized that I had been a part of a coven for a long time. And I realized that witchcraft wasn't uh, something that I was aspiring to at that time. I realized that I particularly wanted to focus on druidic ritual and finding people that would uh, be willing to work in that vein. And where I live here in Springfield, Missouri, we have so many covens, so many goddess groups, so many neo-pagan witchcraft type groups that it came to the point where I said, you know, <clears throat> I have this training on witchcraft now. I can move to this. And I've been involved in Druidry now since 1997, and it is now 2020. So I've been in this for 23 years. And in the year 2001, I started a group called the Order of the Standing Oak, and it's been nonstop ever since. Um, uh, so I'm coming up on 20 years, 20 plus years as a Druid priestess and involved in pagan practice for almost 30 years now. And I wouldn't change a thing for it. I think that's one of the things that makes the pagan movement so awesome. Now, not to say that we don't have our ups and downs and things that kind of tweak it here and there. That sometimes you just going to smack yourself in the head and go, oh God, we don't need any more of that. But the thing for me is I love the people. I love the gods. I love being in a forest at midnight, drumming and dancing around a circle and listening to the spirits of nature out in the woods and listening to the happiness of children as they play and go ring around the rosy and whatever. It's Paganism is something that I can love because there's, there's nothing in paganism that condemns me. There's nothing in paganism that tells me that I'm bad or I'm wrong or I'm this or I'm that. And druidry is something that allows me to focus on the earth, that allows me to focus on the gods, that allows me to focus on the ancestors, and allows me to focus on you, the people that are my brothers and sisters of existence on this planet. I'm sitting here now in my apartment talking to you on Facebook, but I feel like anybody that, that checks in and watches and hangs out with me and listens to me is somebody that is just as important as my own mother and brothers and family because you guys are my family as well. Anybody that would listen and want to understand the things that I'm talking about, those that would, uh, you know, partake in, in uh, listen to the classes that I put out and things like that. And I admit that, you know, there, I may not be the most articulate about things at times, but what I try to do is to give you my honest self, you know, to let you guys know that I don't bullshit you. I try not to bullshit you and that I let you know that I may not know everything, but what I will do is I'll do my damnedest to point you in the direction that you need to be. Um, you know, because that's only fair. It's like you don't want to mislead somebody. And that's one thing I like about Druidry is the fact that you don't have somebody, you're not going to have a Druid knocking on your door at 7 o'clock in the morning going, have you, heard the word of, have you heard the words of the goddess this morning? We're not going to do that. What we're going to do is if you ask us a question, we're going to do our best to answer it and put you on the right direction. Um, and if you ask us about pagan practice specifically, we'll tell you. We will tell you what we know and what we think and give you the information that you need to decide for yourself how you feel about pagan practice and pagan traditions. Um, once that goes into your head, you can go, okay, well, maybe I should go get this book that he was talking about or check out this video or look at this website. 
or talk to this person. It's an avenue for you to discover for yourself what it is you want to do. Because when it comes down to it, all of our spiritual lives are tied to what we do with it. And that's why the Druid movement is so important. Now, one thing I will say that's kind of sad is the fact that, as an example, the life cycle of movements uh, is organic. They start and then they grow and then they decline and then they eventually fade away. As an example of that, in 2017, after many years, the order, or the, not the order's name, the Hengikeltria disbanded. They had some issues. They had some things going on. Tony and Sable couldn't keep it going. There was no impetus for them to keep it going. So the Hinge Keltria disbanded. That's sad. But we still have ADF. It's holding on by a thread. There's been some things that have been going on that have been a little bit disheartening. But there's people that are still out there. The thing that is... Uh, I think one of the things that's kind of uh, uh, a detriment to the Druidic movement is the fact that everybody is into witchcraft. Every place you go, there's books on witchcraft. You can go to Barnes & Noble. You can go to Hastings. You can go to Walden Books. You can go to anywhere, and you're going to find some kind of a basic book on witchcraft. You're going to find TV stations and news crews going out and looking for the local coven at Salon to see them doing ritual and these other things and they do their puff piece for you know whatever it is at that time of year at Salon uh, just to let you know that there are witches that live in your neighborhood but the thing about it is the only time that druids may get any kind of uh, press is if we happen to be at a St. Patrick's Day parade or if we happen to do ritual at um, you know some kind of a park or something for one of the one of the uh, uh, summer festivals like midsummer and stuff like that there's not a lot of press for druids because we're not in large numbers like witchcraft is and of course you have movies movies like the craft and some others that are out there that have kind of glorified uh, uh, magic and things like that it's going to put the people that watch it into a little bit more of a mood to uh, practice and study and do these things and learn about it than you would about Druidry. I don't think I've actually seen any movies that are fully adapted and made about Druidry unless they were made by pagans. But, I mean, as far as mainstream, there's really nothing that, uh, that uh, you know, is out there. And the, I think the one thing that's important, that's why I teach here. That's why I do what I do on Facebook. That's why I do what I do here in my town by offering classes. And our order does belting in the park. This year would have been our fourth year in a row. But because of the pandemic, we weren't able to do it. But when things go back to normal, you can bet we're going to be in our local park doing whatever and if we can ever get people to stop being afraid of going camping I don't know what the deal is with people these days but we're gonna go back out to the woods and we're gonna be pagan once again but uh, and that's where you guys come in too you guys that are out there that are studying and working with various groves and stuff we are the future of Druidry in the United States anybody and their brother can learn Wicca and witchcraft and ceremonial magic and as a true and all this because those are the things that are in because of the Vikings TV show and all this other stuff. But Druids kind of get the short end of the stick because nobody has taken the time to uh, glorify us in the media the way these other things have. So we're going to be on the end of it. But even then, I think we're the ones that are kind of kind of balance things out. And what I mean by balance things out is be the people that keeps all the sensational bullshit away um, you know we are the ones I think that are a little bit more grounded in the things of the earth the ancestors and all this other stuff we're not so much into the pointy hats and you know riding the broomstick and, and all of that things that witchcraft and other traditions are we're all interconnected don't get me wrong but I think as far as a movement a modern movement Druidry is going to be the bedrock that is going to kind of uh, 
keep the helium balloon of, of fanciful craft and uh, you know commercialism and stuff. We're going to be the ones with the hands on the string, keeping it from flying away. Um, because once you get to that point where it just goes off into a whole nother realm, it's like, you know, we'll never see the light of day. But I think that's another thing is those of us that are working with groves and groups and orders and writing books and teaching classes and doing these things, we're going to give you the bedrock, what you need to study and learn and start your own traditions that work within uh, druidic context and carry it on because later on down the line a thousand years from now we're going to be the ancient druids can you believe that once we're gone and dead for a thousand years we are the ancient druids think about how far back the ancient druids are for us we're going to be the ancient druids for somebody else so that's why i do what i do um you know it's not glamorous, it's not glory filled, but what it does is it gives me satisfaction to know that I'm able to even help just one or two people because then I know that once uh, they understand themselves a little bit better as a magical being, we're all magical beings. And when we look at it that way and we see how we interact with the gods and how we interact with the, the spirits of place and nature and things like that, and then we, after we've done that, we look at ourselves and we go, this is what keeps me grounded. This is what keeps me from not going off the deep end. We're better people. Everybody else around us can be going crazy, just losing their minds. But us, we have inner peace. We have something that says that we understand who our gods are. Do you understand who your gods are? I hope so. Because that helps you be better. When you meditate, when you light that candle, when you walk that circle, whenever you do whatever it is that you do, um, you're taking into account something that our ancestors have done for, done for years. You're moving a tradition forward. Our movement, even though we have different variations in what we, are, what we do collectively, we are still a tradition. Druidry in its flat-out base form is a tradition. We're not eclectic. We're not borrowing from every single thing. We're working with a framework that is tied to principles of land, sea, and sky, the gods, our people, our tribe, and we're going to move that forward. So, having said that, holy crap, we've got 120 people here. That is so cool. I'm glad you guys, um, I am going to wrap things up here in just a minute, but I'm going to give you some information about some stuff that's going on. Speaking of teaching and learning, this past week I started a new venture, and any of you that are out there that are interested in this, it's free, doesn't cost you a thing, nothing. Uh, what I've been uh, doing is putting together uh, something called the Lore Keepers course, and what this is, it is a uh, Celtic Studies um, uh, curriculum that was developed by author Alexi Kondriotov, which is a very important writer in the uh, realm of uh, Celtic studies and um, Druidic practice for many years. And uh, what I'm doing is I'm taking that course and I'm transcribing it down to a form where it is on uh, audio an audio video format. And what I'm doing is I'm taking it, it comes in three tracks. The tracks are history, language, and reconstructionism. Because this deals with the idea that this is a multi-faceted uh, covering of Druidry and its forms of uh, Druidism and Celtic reconstructionism and Celtic studies. So what this is, is what I'm doing is I'm taking and making video presentations of each of these tracks, history, language, and reconstructionism, and putting them out in a video format. And uh, at various points in the uh, course, I will be sending out uh, uh, worksheets that have questions that will either be um, multiple choice or have essay questions that you can fill out that will test your knowledge of what's being presented in the course. And this is 
just shy of being a college level course. There is a lot to it. This is going to be going out over time. And the first installment, I finished it up, I don't know, maybe four days ago. And I'm going to be working oh, on uh, another segment, the first segment of the history track, Who Are the Celts? I hope to have it up by the end of the week. And to do that, if you're interested in this, it's free. You don't have to commit any time other than what you're willing to commit to, to watch a video. And the video shouldn't be more than 10 minutes long at the most, I wouldn't think, depending on what uh, the, the subject matter is for whatever track that I'm putting out for the week. But to be a part of this, all I need you to do is message me here on Facebook. And when you message me here on Facebook, just slip me your email address, whichever email address that you use for general email. And what I'll do is I'll put that into uh, our Lorekeeper uh, course uh, group folder and what I do is I take and once a week once we get the next segment up I'll take and I'll mail it out to everybody and you can peruse it and eventually you will get um, a document form that will come either as text or possibly PDF I haven't decided yet but one of the two that makes it easier for you to fill out and then you will uh, have the opportunity to do some questions about what you've watched and then you continue, then we'll move into the segments on language and then the last segments on uh, reconstruction. So that's for anybody that wants to, just need you to get a hold of me and uh, message me and let me know your email address so that I can get that to you. Also, we have our web presence here on Facebook, which is Missouri Druid School. Um, we've got some really cool people that have been coming in and coming through in the last few weeks. Um, we've got this oak leaves that we just did tonight. And our next class that's coming up is Druid School Lesson 9. And this week's lesson coming up on Thursday, the 21st of May at 7 p.m. Central Time. We're going to be talking about Philodect and Bardic Arts. This is the show, or this is the get together in class where we talk about everything that, to deal with the bards, from song, uh, songwriting, story writing, uh, the purpose behind what the bards were, um, everything. We're going to be going over it in, in a deep dive to give those of you that are interested an idea of what it means to go into the studies of the philodect or the bard. And... I, like I said at the beginning of this, that I believe that one of the I believe that the bard is the one uh, part of druidry that ties everything else together. Because without the lore that has been saved and held together through the centuries by the bards, we wouldn't have what we have today. We wouldn't have the knowledge and stories and things that we have. That uh, other than the stuff that has been uh, uh, basically supposedly uh, viewed by Roman and Greek writers. I mean, the bards of the Celts were the ones that were there. You know, you have others. Uh, a secondhand report a lot of times can be false or not just, it can be watered down. It cannot be the exact same thing. But if you get it from a bardic viewpoint, for the most part, you're going to get a better view and you're going to get a more accurate view of what was going on in Celtic society, Irish society. Uh, at the time that the bards were uh, at and that in that space of existence, so this week we've got that class going on, and then we're next Sunday we're going to be having our next oak leaves, and we're going to be doing more classes next week's class. I don't know what this coming up oak leaves is going to be. We'll post about that, but next class we're going to be talking about Celtic and Irish animism. We're going to be talking about the importance and 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 uh, meaning of sacred animals to the Celts and Druidic practice. So we're going to be talking about the salmon, the boar, the deer, the hawk, the raven, all of these different things and how they are portrayed in stories and what they are, what their meanings are when used in magical practices and all kinds of things. So we've got some great classes that are going to be coming up. Um, also, for those of you that have questions and would like to learn a little bit more about Druidry in general and you want to ask a question, 
feel free to message me or you know catch me in the Missouri Joy School group and or you know anywhere here on Facebook and I'll do my best to answer your question you know I, I believe that it's my duty as a, a priest to help you know be there for people so we can do that and um, I'm always looking for somebody new to talk to that has a different uh, out outlook and point of view on life so if you just want a, a friend to talk to I'm good with that a lot of things are going on with this pandemic and people are feeling scared and alone and things like that so it's like it's always good to have a sympathetic ear and somebody that is going to be there for you and I hope you guys have gotten just a little bit more uh, fact to learn about where Druidry came from um, if if you like what we talked about tonight give me a thumbs up give me some loves let me know what you thought about it uh, leave a comment as we get ready to leave um, we're gonna wind this up and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a drink holy crap we've got 130 people that is so cool I'm glad you guys got to hang out with me tonight and just listen to me talk about things you know because this is one thing that is important you know knowing where the modern drew movement came from and I'm gonna take this drink And what we're going to do is what we always do at the end of class or at the end of an oak leaf session is we're just going to kick back just a little bit. Thank you for that, loves. I appreciate it. What we're going to do is we're going to kick back and we're going to close our eyes. And we are going to chant the all in three times and just end this on some good energy. And uh, when I say thank you, guys, hope to see you for the next class which is going to be this next Thursday and more oak leaves. So what we're going to do is we're going to close our eyes. Take a deep breath. Ah. May the blessings of body, mind, and spirit be yours. Thank you, Judy. That was so cool. Um, I'm glad that you, even where you're at there in Australia, have the have the the ability to just take out and spend a little time with me. It's always so good to have you here. Um, and we've got Sarah, and uh, we've just got so many other people that are here. I appreciate you guys. And what I'm going to do is before uh, here in a minute after I close this out, I am going to process it run it through some uh, equipment on my computer and I'm going to uh, render it so that I can put it up on YouTube so whenever this is finished I will have this up probably a little bit later this evening and you guys can watch it again uh, and I'll put it out there for people that weren't able to make it but I appreciate um, uh, everybody that's here and blessings to you Sarah I'm so glad that you got to hang out with me for a little bit tonight and uh, like I say, if you're interested in the Lord Keepers course, message me your email. And having said that, from the altar to the ring, I appreciate you all so very much. And I look forward to you seeing you for the next class and the next Oak Leafs and so on and so forth. And having said that, I'm going to say have a great Sunday. Have a great rest of the week. Be safe. And I will see you guys again soon.